I want to start off by saying thank you so much for joining me. This is, I'm just thrilled to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. This is so exciting. So Judge Boyd is a judge in Bear, Texas, not spelled like you would think when you try to look it up. And she is phenomenal. If you just tell a little bit about yourself and then we'll get right into it. All right. Well, I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, and I ended up coming to San Antonio for law school. And when I was in law school, all my friends were like, Stephanie, you have to stay. We're all going to stay. Now all of my friends are in Austin, Colorado. I'm like, how did you end up in Colorado? And you all told me you were going to stay here. But it turned out to be one of the best things because even though San Antonio is a big city, it has a small town feel to it. So even though I was coming from a small city, Shreveport, Louisiana, coming here, I didn't feel as though, oh my gosh, I'm a country girl and this city is so big. I'm still learning locations of things, uh, but hey, that's what GPS is for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a short piece of me and how I got here. All right. I love it. Well, let's start by talking about your upbringing, because I know when I was listening to your court one day, there was a defendant that was claiming that was his rough upbringing that led him to where he was. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know what? You have no idea where I came from. And I made other choices, which we'll talk about choices later. I love it. Um, but can you t let us a little bit about your upbringing and what things were like for you? Sure. Um, so as I said, I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. I have an older brother and a younger brother. So I'm the middle child. But because I'm the only girl, my brother still me, treat me like I'm the baby. <laughs> so my mom is like, to my younger brother one time, she's like, what are you talking about her curfew? She's older than you, you know, stop. So, and then whenever I would um, meet a guy, they all wanted to meet him. But my parents divorced when I was very young. So the people who raised me were my mom, my grandmother, and the male figures in my life were my two uncles. Um, one of my uncles, he served in Vietnam, he's since passed. So when I grew up, uh, my mom was all about your work ethic because I always tell this story. My mom um, had a bad marriage, so she gets divorced. She comes back to Shreveport because she was in Dallas and she grew up in this small town called Grand Cane, Louisiana, and she got married straight out of high school. So when she comes back to my grandmother's house, she has children and she has to work and she put in applications everywhere. She put in an application to work on the garbage truck. And I always tell people, there is no shame in working on a garbage truck. Somebody has to do it and they do great work. My mom actually personally knows the people who collect her trash and she considers everybody her children. So they're like her sons to her. And she put in an application for that. She put in an application for Libby Glass. And she was going to go start working on the garbage truck. And that was back in the day where one, people didn't have trash bags. They were, I don't know if people remember this. You would have the tin cans, you line it with newspapers and put your trash in that. And then they would, somebody would get off the truck and dump it. So she was going to be riding on the back of a truck. What ends up happening is she gets called to work at Libby Glass. And so she gets to work at Libby Glass, but she's on rotating shifts. So every seven days, her shift changed and she would have three days off, but seven days morning and then three days off, then seven days, the afternoon shift, three days off, seven days graveyard shift. So the time that I would spend with her, the quality time was when she would be able to be home to give me my bath. So that's where our conversations would happen. I knew my mom loved me. I knew my mom wanted to be at every school event, but I knew she couldn't be at every school event. And so from that, my mom taught me one, if you have children, your children need to come first because they can't support themselves. You got to make sure they're fed. You got to make sure they're clothed and you still got to spend that emotional time with them. So in my childhood, my things that i learned, i learned from my mom and my grandmother, believe it or not in Shreveport, when I was growing up, you didn't have to attend kindergarten. So I didn't start school till first grade. And even though I started school at first grade, the school I started at was Central Free, Central Free Methodist. It was right across the street from my grandmother. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to school. I'm going to school. I'm anxious. My mom had me dressed so pretty going to school. I get to school and my mom is trying to uh, drop me off. 
and I am losing it. I'm having a full meltdown. First grader having a full melt meltdown and other children are like, Stephanie, it's going to be great. I'm like, no, it's not. Nobody told me I was getting left here. And so my mom finally calmed me down and she leaves. But the good thing about it, when I started first grade, I already knew how to read. I already knew how to tell time because my grandmother, my mother would teach me certain things. I already knew how to answer phones, <laughs> you know, the basics of life. But the funny thing that happens I'm at school and my mom and my grandmother would tell this story to anybody who's who would listen. Lunch break comes and I'm thinking, OK, yay, I made it. It's done. So I leave the school, walk across the street and go back to my grandmother's house. And she's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm here to watch all my children. We're done for the day. And she's <laughs> like, what? And so my grandmother said the teacher or the principal came down from the school because they knew where she lived, knocked on the door. And they wanted to spank me. And my grandmother said, you will not spank her. She doesn't know. This is her first year in school. And they're like, oh, that explains everything. We're good now. <laughs> and so that was the best experience. And that was a private school. And then from there, I went to West, West Shreveport Elementary School. That was a public school. So I sent, spent a year there. Then I went to West Report, and that's where my my older brother was, my cousins were, and my mom purposely wanted me at Center Free Methodist across from my grandmother because she knew that I was going to have a hard time. I didn't think I was going to have a hard, hard time. I was, like, excited about it. But when you get to the point that people are leaving and they're not staying there with you, not so exciting. But I came to really, really love school. And my teacher at Center Free Methodist, Miss Leslie, she said, you need to remember the name, all, name of all of your teachers. So I did. And then um, we were poor. We didn't know we were poor. Like now for Christmas, you see children getting 30 gifts. You would get one gift and you would be so excited. Like you got the bicycle, yay! And that would be your one gift. It wasn't like, oh, we're opening dozens of presents. But I learned work ethic because I used to sell Christmas cards. And you know how you had the newspaper article and you would have a little ad and it would say, sign up, sell Christmas cards, and you can get free stuff or you can get money. So I got my Christmas cards in the mail and I went door to door selling them. And then my brothers were like, this is great. You're making some money. Of course, you know, the money I was making like $5, but $5 was a lot. Yeah, it was. You could go to the mom and pop store around the corner and just clean up with $5. But I would do that. And I, I would also rake yards and make money doing that. And it was great to have money to you go to the store and like, oh, I'm getting a pickle. It's five. It's, it's 25 cents. So those were great days, but it was always work ethic and then it's a shame that some children will not have the upbringing that we had even though it was my mom my they were divorced um we would do things like you could walk and pick peaches walk and pick pears there was a guy who lived up the street from us and he would always say hey be sure let the children come pick the pears and everything and we would go you could walk pick pears and walk around, not worry that somebody was going to kidnap you. And we would just go play outside all day. And then we would have to be home before the lights came on. And it was funny because when the street lights came on and it was still light outside a little bit, we would be begging, please let us stay out. I mean, <laughs> drinking from the water hose, people don't do that anymore. I don't know if you can survive that now. But my childhood was really a lot of fun and there were up and down hills things that we had to go through but it was great childhood it's amazing and i think a lot of it is perspective too you know because some people might say oh we only had this or only had the but no but you had a love too and you had people directing you and teaching you i think that was the big it's such an important part of growing up is having that positive influence and that's something that you try to do in court which i love and the parenting classes having people learn because a lot of people, when they grow up, they don't know how to be a parent. That is so true. And I don't think people realize 
that when you have a child, my mom always told us, hey, if you're going to have children, you got to put your child first because they can't support themselves. And now I think that people will have children and their child is still not first. And I'm like, what are you doing? Child can't support itself. You, you can no longer do what you did before you had a child. That's the thing about having children. You know, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to the club. And what I've seen in my time as a defense attorney and prosecutor, what ends up happening is you have somebody who has a child. They go to the club, let's say on a Friday night, they meet some guy. They bring that guy back to their house and that guy just never leaves. And then the mother goes to work on Monday and they're letting this complete stranger babysit their children. Then something happens. And I'm like, in what world are you bringing strangers into your home? I would have clients all the time and I would say, hey, let's say you um, go to this house and there's a complete stranger and it's two men. Are you going to stay there? You don't know them. You're just going to stay there. And they say, hey, come on. Yeah, you can stay. Here's the bedroom. Are you going to stay there? They're like, no. I'm like, that's what you're doing with your children. I'm like, people need to stop thinking of children as property a little bit and start thinking of them as human beings. They have feelings. And guess what? These are strangers to them. And you've just brought them into their world. And they're thinking that you're supposed to protect them. So they're thinking, oh, surely this adult who loves me knows what they're doing by bringing in this complete stranger. And they really don't. That's not something I didn't really think about before, but it probably happens more than a lot of us realize. Oh, it does. And that, that kind of leads us into, okay, I love it when people say they made a mistake in your courtroom because there are no, mis a lot of times they're not mistakes. They're, they are choices and you have something that you tell everybody. And I just, I think if you're listening and maybe your child or your grand, whatever, they say, I made a mistake. This is the greatest way of knowing is it a mistake or is it a choice because unfortunately a lot of the things we do most of them they're choices yes you know so my mom and my grandmother always explained it to this to me this way and they always say life is about choices and so my mom will always call me from Shreveport and she'll say Stephanie it's going to rain today be sure to take your umbrella so I always tell people this is the difference between a choice and a mistake you know it's going to rain. You bring your umbrella. Your umbrella is black. You're in court. You sit next to another person. They have a black umbrella. You know it's raining. You finish with your case. You leave. You go outside. You're thinking, hey, I'm glad I brought my umbrella because it is raining. When you open your umbrella, it has somebody else's initials on it. That's a mistake because you brought a black umbrella. You just picked up the wrong one. Here's a choice. Let's say my mom doesn't call me to say it's going to rain. I go to court. I finish my cases. People are coming in with their umbrellas and I can tell, hey, it's been raining and it still is raining. Somebody has an umbrella next to me. I know I didn't bring one, but it's raining. So I pick it up and I walk outside, open the umbrella and walk off. That's a choice. You know, you didn't have an umbrella, but you've made a calculated decision. You know what? I don't want to get wet. I didn't bring my umbrella. I'm taking this person's umbrella. Those are choices. I love that. I don't know why it just, it just sticks with me. And, and, and the attorneys that come and I know they've been in your court before and yep. they'll say my, you know, my client, he's made a choice or he's made a mistake. And I'm like, Oh no, you know, what's going to happen. Why are you saying that? I don't know. <laughs> no, these are choices. And I think if people start realizing, Hey, I'm making choices. You may not be making good choices, but there's still choices you're making. Like when I have people who don't report for probation and you say, well, I had to go to work. All right. So you have waited out and you have waited out and you said, you know what? I'm going to go to work. I'm not going to report to probation. When in my court, all you have to do is pick up the phone and call the probation officer. Hey, I'm going to lose my job if I report today. Is it OK if I report tomorrow? And the problem is that sometimes people have never been raised or in their lifetime have had to make decisions and know how to handle when you can't meet certain obligations. Their uh, response to obligations is, okay, I'm just going to throw my hands up and we'll see what happens, <laughs> you know? 
yeah. this is what I'm doing. The, the thought process is not there. And for younger people, it's very hard because a lot of the young people who are in my court, if you can imagine, some of them are from homes where they've been in child protective services. And then they go from child protective services to here. And so I have some people that I have come in like once a month or every three months so I can check on them and make sure that they are in line with what they're supposed to do. And sometimes I will have what's called compliance hearings because those are people who are on probation. Some of them are young and they don't understand the process because they've been in other courts, other things have happened. So they're still in fear of telling probation, hey, you know, I'm struggling. I'm using drugs. I'm sorry. You know, I can't stop when all you have to do is come into court. And if it's something that we can help you with where you can be rehabilitated, then we can see about doing that. But a lot of times it's like, oh, I use, they're going to know I use, I'm going to be positive. So I'm just not going to report. And then everything goes downhill from there. They just stop. They just go back to the way things have been in the past. Yeah. And, but I think I've been watching several different judges and I think you have a safe place for people to go where they can say, Hey, I messed up or I can't stop. But mm -hmm. it seems like some of the, some, some of the judges make different decisions than you make. Yeah. And, and it seems to be, and, and that, let's see, I'm trying to phrase it right. Yeah. There, it's pretty open, the decisions that judges can make. And so if someone gets in your courtroom, you really, you truly want to rehabilitate them. You don't want, you're not just looking at punishment, but it seems as though many judges are just looking at punishment maybe, and they just get you in and get you out kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so those, I don't know, do you, do most judges want to do what you want to do? And I don't know. I will tell you, all of us go to judges school, right? And at judges school, they always tell you to say as little as possible on the record. Me, I'm not that way because I think communication is key. Even when I have to send somebody to prison, I take no joy in sending the pe people to prison, but I try to let them know the reason why. And then sometimes they're like, okay, I understand why you would do this. Even my brother called me one time and my brother said, oh my gosh, how is he thanking you for giving him 15 years in prison? He's like, I would be very upset. I said, well, I'm hoping that he understands the reason why. But I always tell people, when I place you on probation, I want you to succeed. If I didn't think you were going to do this, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, of course, to say this person is going to commit a crime. But I want you to succeed. I want to give you the tools to succeed. Obviously, the state wants you to have probation. Otherwise, they wouldn't have offered it. You've agreed to do it. Hopefully you think you can do it. And that's my goal. I hate when people have to come back and I have to send them to prison because when you're sending something to prison, you know, you're hoping that they'll, they'll then get rehabilitated in prison, but to get rehabilitated in prison, you have to really want it because there are hundreds of people there who are not rehabilitated and they're not looking to get rehabilitated, especially when I send people who are super young to prison, that sort of breaks my heart a little bit because they're 18, they're 19. And I already know prison life is not going to be easy for them. But I always think of people who come to my court, not as defendants. I think of them as a human being. And I always wonder what got them to the place they are at, you know, Surely, when you are in elementary school, you're not saying, oh, you know, I want to go out and steal cars or, oh, I want to be a prostitute or, oh, I want to be a drug addict or a drug dealer. I don't think that was your goal in elementary school. So I'm always trying to figure out why are you here? Is there any way that we can change your thought process so you won't come back here? So that um, that's my thought process. And of course, at the forefront of my mind is always protecting the community. So there are some people who are dangerous and I'm just like, hey, we can't have you in the community for now. Yeah. So if someone's listening and they've got maybe they've got a child or a grandchild that's mm -hmm. dealing with legal issues, they keep getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. 
and as parents, a lot of times, sometimes it is our fault because we've enabled or done whatever, but sometimes they're just, they've made choices to do the things that are not what we taught. Do you have any advice for someone who's maybe looking at someone in their family who's going through all these things, ways that we can help from the outside? I mean, I don't have a child in that situation, you know, but people who do. Well, I will tell you, um, I lecture at UTSA. So all of my students who thought they wanted to do criminal work, always try to find mentors for them in the field that they're looking at going into. Because I always say, before you spend what's going to be the equivalent of a mortgage, you need to know what's what. So they would love going to do the tour of the jail, tour of the prison. The prison we can do as much because of COVID and everything. But for parents who have a child who's being rebellious, I would talk to whoever your sheriff is or your police chief is and see if they could arrange for you and your child to have a tour of your local jail. You know, not a scared, shape, a straight type of thing, but just to give them information because you'd be surprised at what happens at the Bear County Jail here. For example, one thing that people never think of, you all are sharing the same underwear. There is no, oh, let me put your name tag on yours. It's like they all go, in, go into the washer. They all come out the same. Um, if you want bathroom tissue to use the restroom, you have to go to the sergeant's desk and say, hey, I'm going to use the restroom. Could I have some sheets? And based upon what you're doing, they'll determine the amount of sheets and that you're showering with everybody. To me, I think just seeing where they shower, where they sleep, what the food they eat would help your child say, oh, well, I really don't want to be here. That's one big help. And the other big thing is um, I would always tell young people, you need to make sure that you know who you are with, who your friends are. Because as a defense attorney, I would never, um, well, I would always have young people, majority of their offenses, they work at a department store and they're giving people discounts. And I always tell people, if that is not your family, you know, that's illegal. They're like, what? I'm like, yes. I said, so when you have your friends come in and they're just like, hey, can you just give us a discount? And you do that, that's a problem. I had a couple of clients who had that situation. And I always tell them those cases where you're dealing with money, uh, those are crimes of moral turpitude. And if you have a crime of moral turpitude, that eliminates a lot of job opportunities for you. Anything that involves you having a license, you want to be a nurse, you want to be an attorney, you want to be a doctor, all of that that requires state licenses. If you have a crime of moral turpitude on your record, doesn't matter if it's deferred adjudication with no conviction or not that's going to be a stumbling block for you. And I tell them, make sure you know who you're getting in a vehicle with, because if you get a vehicle with somebody and they have drugs in that vehicle, guess what? Police is charging everybody in that vehicle with drugs. And I guarantee you, your friend is not going to say, excuse me, I was the one who had those drugs, not them, take me. That is rare that they do that. So young people need to know seriously who they're hanging out with who their friends are and parents need to start getting more in their children's business my mom was always in our business and i appreciated it i was the child my mom always says you were the perfect child I'm like no i wasn't she's like no you were but i always saw things hey stephanie these are the rules if you conform to these rules your childhood would be just fine so my mom would have a curfew I'm like, okay, my curfew is 10. I would love if it was later, but it's at 10. Everybody, I'm going to start going home at 9.30 because I want to make sure I'm there at 10. My brothers would push the envelope on curfew. And my mom is like, no, there would be no pushing of envelopes on curfew. And so I would talk to my brothers and I would say, hey, why don't you just follow the curfew? And maybe if you follow the curfew, my mom would say, huh, they're responsible. We can extend the curfew. I'm like, I don't know why you all are bucking up against the system. So I was always a conformist in the house. If my mom said, hey, you're not allowed to go outside while I'm at work. I'm like, OK, I won't be going outside. 
but my brothers always want to test things. So sometimes you have children who are going to test boundaries, but what I have discovered about children is they love boundaries. And when parents don't give them that, that's an issue. Yeah, they definitely, kids need boundaries. They, they really, they feel safe and they feel loved, you know, and my son gets mad at me. It does seem to be the boys, honestly, my mm -hmm. youngest son, but you know, I tell him if I didn't care, I'd let you do whatever. Right. I, I don't let you do whatever because I care. And uh, OK, so we talked a little bit about about growing up. And I think this kind of the differences in people mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up, my parents had friends from all different groups, races, countries, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it seems like right now everyone's at odds with each other, like everyone's mm -hmm. fighting about whatever it is. Um, and so I was reading an article about you and you were talking about on the bench but you said, I want to see male, female, all different races, all different creeds, because I think it just makes us so much better. Yes. And I think, um, how do you think as a culture, we can, I don't know, I wasn't perfect before, certainly. Yes. Um, but we can take a little bit of what we had before and make it so much better into the future, because it seems like right now, every day, almost, there's one more reason for people to argue with each other and have factions. Well, I think we have become extremely impatient, right? And you're right, we become less tolerant. You just have to meet people. For example, when I grew up at Central Free Methodist, there were only black students. West Streetport Elementary, only black students. I think, um, and then I went to uh, Jess Clark Junior High School, now they're called middle schools. Only black students. Brigger T. Washington, which is a historic school in uh, Shreveport. That was the first uh, school for African-Americans that was built in Shreveport. Great school. So that is the first time that there were any white students in our class. And, they were, and there were two, right? And they were not in my class because we were in different grades. But... Uh, when I left there, because in the neighborhood I lived, there were all different type of um, people there, white people, black people, Hispanic people, everybody. And we would just play together. And that again, that was back in the time where you would just send children out to play. You weren't concerned that somebody was going to kidnap them. And so you would end up at the basketball court just playing with a bunch of people. Somebody has a ball. Hey, you want to play kickball? Yeah, let's play kickball. And so you got to know people. Then when I went to undergrad, grad, and law school, that's when I started meeting people from all over the world, people who were speaking different languages. And I love, love, love different languages. Some people in my class spoke six or seven languages. And usually those were the people who were from the Middle East. They spoke a lot of languages. I'm like, man, I would love to be able to speak all these languages. And... What you will discover if people will just take time to listen, people are basically the same. Guess what? Um, I want you to treat me fairly. I want to be heard. I want you to listen. There was some meme that somebody had uh, where it shows a sponge and a brick. And water is drop, dropping on the sponge and the brick. They're like, the sponge is listening to what you're saying and internalizing it. And the brick is just getting ready to respond. So we need to start actually listening, internalizing, because everyone has a reason, hopefully, for the way they feel. And I think with all of the turmoil we have, if you would just stop once somebody says something to you, then say, hey, why do you feel that way? For example, somebody got upset and they told my coordinator, I don't like her because she gave people credit for getting the COVID shot right, in, in lieu of community service hours. So I told the person, I said, you know, I hear you and I understand what you're saying. I said, but let me just tell you the reason for that. During COVID, there was nowhere to send people for community service hours and community service hours were required. I said, I gave people choices. If you want to get the COVID shot, then, and if you were to get the COVID shot, then your community service hours would be waived. I didn't force anybody to say, hey, you got to get the COVID shot. 
And I would tell some people, if you want to pay it off, you can pay it off at the cost of minimum wage. And if you want to, I would suggest the San Antonio Food Bank, but you can give it to whatever charity you want that's approved. I said, but I suggest the food bank because they're running low on food. And then when I told the person there, they're like, oh, OK. I'm like, yeah, I don't force anybody to get shots. I'm not a doctor. I'm not trying to f- interfere with whatever your religious beliefs may be. These are just options for you. But I cannot let you leave probation without having done community service. And they're like, now I understand. I said, so people, don't go on the stove and be bawling until you figure out why people are doing things that they do. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that is the secret, right? It's just listening, listening mm-hmm. to it, It's so true. Um, and speaking about people complaining, um, some attorneys are having a hard time with your court being on YouTube. Yes. Um, and I, so I was reading about that. So what's your opinion on that? And why do you think it's so important for courts to be transparent? Because these are elected positions and everybody, I think that everybody needs to know what, what is happening in your court. And the courtrooms legally, they're supposed to be open to the public. But here in Bad County, we had an incident where there was a big fight in the courtroom. Right. And so I'm always trying to make the deputy's job as easy as possible because the deputies are in charge of security. And when you think about it, the deputies, who do they have to protect? The judge, the attorneys, the inmates who are in the box. And then you have some people who are on the docket and charged with offenses who are just in the gallery that everybody's bringing their family. And so you may end up with, you could easily end up with a hundred people in the courtroom and my courtroom won't hold a hundred people. So now people know, hey, you know what? I don't have to come down to the courtroom to see what's happening. I can watch it and I can know if I really need to be there for my relative or, you know, if I just want to see what's going on. And I don't have to come down and pay parking. Parking has gotten so outrageous in Bear County. $30. A defendant just came before me and said, well, I was trying to find parking because it's $25. So my thing is the courtroom should be open to the court. And you'd be shocked how many people who complain about YouTube. And then people tell me, they say, judge, just as an aside, I'm like, what? And these are other attorneys who come up to me. They're like, you know, that attorney has a TikTok with their cases on it. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah. I said, well, I really don't mean people think I'm I'm, uh, savvy with social media. I'm really not. It's the... Uh, state actually set up YouTube for the judges for COVID. So the most I can do, and they say this is the older person's thing, the most I can do is post on Facebook a couple of times. But as far as TikTok, Instagram, and I know all of these because I have to read it when I'm doing the charges, TikTok, Instagram, MySpace, Facebook, now Facebook I'm good at, Twitter, all of that, X, I don't really even do any of that. But they tell me, they're like, oh, that attorney, you know, they're on YouTube. Do you know they actually have one of their cases that they did in front of you? They put it on their YouTube page. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well. But no, I um, I do it so it can be transparent to everyone. And the public will know what's going on. Because to me, being on YouTube really is no different than allowing Uh, the media to come into your courtroom and film everything. And if you could imagine courtroom is packed and then you have all those large cameras in there, that's taking up more space. So, Right. Yes, I agree. I really like it. But what do you think about the people who watch? Now, some people, there's other guys who take your court cases and then they film it on their own. They put it on their own channel Mm -hmm. and comments about judges and attorneys and defendants. and, And what's your opinion about that? Well, I would hope that people would be nice because these jobs that we have, they are not easy. And I remember when I was a defense attorney, people would say, oh, how can you represent that person? And I have to tell them, you know what? Everybody's presumed to be innocent. And unless I was, I, I was there, I don't know what really happened. You know, I'm looking at the evidence and everybody deserves representation. Otherwise, why do we even have a legal system? You think somebody commits a crime? You just do street justice, right? Um, so I would hope that people would be nice. We really need to be kind to each other because honestly, everybody's just trying to do, do their job. 
and do it to the best of their abilities. And even when you have um, the accused before me, I always tell people, you, you don't know what that person's life story is. There are some cases that I had as a CPS attorney and I represented children. And I always tell everybody, look, I already know this child is going to have a bad life. And unless they 100% say, I'm changing, I'm doing this, they're going to end up in a criminal court. And one of the clients I actually represented on the CPS size, 15 years later, they ended up in a criminal court. And I'm sitting there waiting for my case to be called on something else. And I hear the name and I tell his attorney, hey, I can tell you things about this if he, he wants me to tell you things about his life. I said, but his life was horrible. He's like, what? Really? I'm like, yes. I said, but see if he wants me to talk to you about it. And if he does, I will. And so I did. He's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. So when people stand before you, you never know the trauma they've been through and what has gone on with their life. So we should really try to be more understanding and sympathetic and not just fly off the handle and say, oh, what a horrible person or you know, you don't know where they've been. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, the things that some people grow up thinking are normal, they're not normal, but they don't know. Yeah. They don't know. So, yeah, that's that's really good. Okay, now for some more of the fluffy stuff, the flowers on your desk. Yes. There's always fresh flowers. And I thought it would be better for you to tell about the flowers and why. All right. So my mom always told me, she said, the most time you will spend is at work and at home. And she's like, you may end up spending more time at work than you actually do at home, which has always been the case with me. She said, you should have flowers. And she's like, you should have flowers every week. And so believe it or not, the flowers I get every week, they probably are maybe $20 tops, right? And she would say, you work hard. If you can't afford to send, spend $20 on yourself a week, then why are you working? So that's why I have flowers. And then some people will give me flowers because I speak at a lot of places. Like I'll go speak at uh, senior, with senior citizens to talk to them about the law and, you know, maybe when they would think about getting an attorney. And I speak at book fest, that type of thing. And they will end up giving me flowers. I'm like, oh, thanks. So sometimes when it's like a florist shop, it's because I've spoken at different events and people are like, hey, here's the flowers, here's the flowers. So I'm like, yeah. And right now I'm living in a hotel, so I can't really do anything. Uh, okay. And the purse, is it a different purse? It's not a different purse every day. You put these beautiful purses <laughs> up, flowers. All right. So let me just tell you about that. I don't buy any of my purses, right? My mom actually buys purses for me. So how many I have, I don't know. My mom gets them for me. And I love like, I saw this. I'm like, oh, thanks, mom. But you don't have to. She's like, no, no, no. So, yes. It's, it's, it's just neat. It's a, it's a signature thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. And another thing like, along the same lines is when I first started watching you, I thought you were in your 30s. But then you kept saying something about that whatever I'm time. The twilight of my life. Yeah. And I thought, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So your skincare routine is a, is amazing it must be can you let us in a little bit on that because your skin is flawless okay see you're so awesome because i my mom always says you're your worst critic you're your worst critic because i always think my skin is going through changes right so um i'm 56 and what i do my skin routine ha has changed a little bit because i used to do biore i guess that's b-j-o-r-e so I do use the Biore strips for the nose, but now uh, I realize that since I've been at this hotel, my skin hasn't been moisturized, getting as much moisture as it should be. So now I use Laneige. Laneige has a great product. They have the toner. So I use their cleanser, which is the water cleanser. It's in the blue bottle. And so once you use that, then the next step you use is you use the toner. And the toner is water-based, so it really helps with the moisturizer. And then they have a vitamin C serum, which I use. So toner, I'm sorry, wash, toner, vitamin C serum, 
And then they have a cream that is in the blue little um, jar. And then I put that on and then that's it. Well, it's, it's phenomenal. Your skin oh. it glows and I'm going to be 56 in. Oh, Hey, there we go. We're close. Happy yeah. birth month. Thank you. I know. Isn't that crazy? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I didn't realize. Your you skin was- is beautiful as well. I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't know. I, I've aged. I aged about 30 years in the last four years. It was wild. I look like I was 30 when I turned 50 mm-hmm. and boom, I don't know. Sometimes. Oh, no, but your skin looks beautiful. Oh, I appreciate that. That's because you're our worst critic. See? Our own worst critic. Oh, my goodness. It's so true. But yeah, right. so that's what I use. All right. Well, that's, uh, I'm I'm literally buying that. And I'm going to put it in the show notes so other people know. Okay, that. awesome. Yeah, it is great. And um, I had never used toner before. I only started uni- using toner probably about a month ago. Because somebody said, hey, you should use this toner. I'm like, all right, let me try. And I saw... All of these things would uh, say, oh, Laneige, Laneige. And what ended up happening, I was going to get some uh, perfume for my mom for her birthday. Her birthday is coming up April 22nd. And somebody had put Laneige cream in the back. And I'm like, huh, this feels so great. And I'm like, let me see what that product line is about. And so, yeah. But my mom is a big fan of rock. Okay. And she's like, rock does wonders. Now, does she live in the same town as you now, or is she still in Shreveport? No, she's in Shreveport. Okay. Yeah. As a side note, note, so I've been living in the hotel um, since about October because my house flooded. So little known fact, the hose that goes from the toilet to the wall, you're supposed to change that out every 10 years. So people check those hoses. Really? I didn't yes, know. And you're supposed to change out the hoses to your washer every 10 years. All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, my house is 60 years old. Hey, you, you need to do it. You got to do it. Okay. Well, shoot. Yeah, I had an ice maker line leak once and flooded the whole downstairs. Okay. But um, yeah, we had four kids in the house and lived in a hotel for a week. And that was enough. Mm-hmm. I don't know how. I get, Maybe one person is better, but. Oh my, oh, my mom said, refer to it as my vacation home. So I've been at my vacation home. So that's how I'm thinking of it. There you go. Well, do you have people, is it the kind of one where you can have people come in and change out your things every once in a while? Oh, yes. Oh, well, so there we go. Oh, that's- I come back and I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody cleaned the bathroom and the bed. Yay. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's nice. Well, th- that is the things that I really wanted to touch on. Is there anything that you wanted to share with the world about court or things that they need, they should know, or I don't know, life in general. Oh, well, life in general, I will tell you, aging is great. And I know some people will think of aging because this is fabulous over 50 (laughs) and people like, Oh my gosh, no, but Hey, either you're going to age or you're dead. Right. (laughs) I, I think um, you learn so much. And you really start getting your life together and you learn what's important, right? And you can move about. But one thing you should always do, this is what an attorney told me. He said, Stephanie, if something were to happen, and this is when I was, maybe I was in my 30s or I just turned 30 and I never took a vacation. It was like work, work, work. And I would be working on Saturdays. I would work on Sundays. I would always see my clients at the jail on Saturday. And I would walk to the jail and visit them, even if their case wasn't set on a specific day, just to let them know they hadn't uh, been forgotten. So he said, Stephanie, if you were to die tomorrow, you know, I would miss you terribly. But what do you think would happen? You know, me, I'm thinking he's about to say something flowery, like they're going to shut the city down. Everybody's going to be tears and distraught. And we just don't know how we're going to go on without you. And he said, Stephanie, I will miss you dearly. But they're going to say, OK, who's taking her cases next? And I think, you know, of course, people have to work because I understand financially. You just can't like, oh, I'm taking off going to Europe or something. But. You need to be able, if you can, just take one day off and do absolutely nothing. If you can take, just plan to take one day off every three months if possible. 
and just do absolutely nothing. Don't clean the house. Don't um, do the dishes. Just walk about, exhale, and enjoy life, even if it's just for one day. And so what ended up happening to me is, and you can tell we were young, there was a time where the airline, something had happened, and it went around like wildfire, where you could go to Europe uh, on a flight, $300 round trip. So we were like, oh, look, we're going to Paris. And it was my first time going to Paris. And then me, I'm like, where are we going to stay? They're like, it doesn't matter. Get your ticket. Get your ticket now. So I got my ticket. And then we figured out a place to stay later. And I just fell in love with Paris. Okay. Then I realized when I got back, I was spending probably like $200 a day. Because, you know, it seems like play money because it's so big. And so then I said, you know what, I need to go back to see if I really love Paris or if I was just living like I was extremely wealthy and I was not. So then I went back the next year. I'm like, oh, man, I love this. And then until COVID hit, I was going every single year. So believe it or not, if you want to have a good time in Paris for nine days, people think it's like super, super expensive. For airfare and hotel, it's $1,500 for nine days. And if you can start setting that aside and just look at some place where you're like, you know what? I always want you to go there. Start making a plan of how you're going to get there and then just enjoy it. Like I realize that money is tight because believe it or not, people think attorneys are multimillionaires. Every attorney you see is a billionaire. But on the criminal side, defense attorneys are not millionaires and billionaires. You're just doing it because this is your passion and this is what you love. But set aside some time, some money to do one thing that you want to do. That That's my advice and you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I think that's great. And and it's true about aging, right? And there's all this anti-aging stuff. Well, yeah, if you don't age, you're dead. So yeah. we might as well, you know, and I think a lot of women, when we be, when we turn 50, we, we get our voice for mm-hmm. some reason that we, we just finally can say no, no. Or this is what I want to do and move on. And I think it's so wonderful. But I love that about going and doing the things, right? Because if not now, when are you going to go? Oh, and drink plenty of water. (laughs) I love those cups. Those Bubba cups, those are my favorite. Is that? Oh, gosh. And you know what the best thing about it, too, is they do not, you don't have the condensation. Yeah. I've, I've had a cup that I'm supposed to be drinking. I'm trying to drink, you know, all this water during the day. But the condensation is a killer. So I'm like, okay, I'm going back to Bubba. Well, and those, you can put the big straws so you can drink a smoothie with a fat straw in it. Ooh, I didn't think about that. Yes. And you can put a boba straw in there if you're into that sort of thing. But yeah, you can, because I've had the same smoothie every morning for eight years. It's ridiculous. But those are the one cup that I can use. Awesome. Oh, and the other thing, if you all are in San Antonio, uh, they have the book fest that's going on April 13th. I'm always one of the escorts for the authors, which is great. Well, that's fun. Yeah. Oh, it's a lot of fun. Oh, I want to go. That's yeah. Awesome. And you have authors from all over the world who are who come here for that book fest. And you get to see, of course, they have a lot of activities for the children. And you get to see the children. And I get to shop for books for my niece, which even though she's only two, I'm like, shouldn't she be reading War and Peace now? What's going on? <laughs> so funny. And my And my brother's like, Stephanie. She's finally starting to say a couple of sentences. Let's not rush her. I'm like, okay. Yes, and you have fun things. You have the fiesta and all kinds of great things down there. Yes, but the fiesta, I'm sometimes I'm here for it. Usually I'm not because I um my mom's birthday is April 22nd. So I usually go back to see her. But I do have fiesta medals. So if people want fiesta medals, if you will send me um Self-addressed um, stamp. I mean, sorry, self-addressed envelope. Then I can mail it back to you. Otherwise, I would send it and say, "Ah, oh, I'll send it for you." But that gets to be extremely expensive when you're sending it to everybody. So you can get them while they last. There we go. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you again for joining me. This has been so amazing. I appreciate you taking the time to join us and. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Oh, thank you so much. It has been a joy. 